Um, hello and good evening to all our eminent speakers and participants in this webinar. Uh, my name is Peter. Um, I am the group uh, CEO of TMI. Um, as we all know, HR has changed and how. In the last 18 months, we have changed the way we work. Uh, not by choice, though. The change happened and we adapted as we had to sustain the businesses. Today, the minor adjustment has become the norm, as some are calling it the new normal. Recruitment, training, performance measurement, and every other aspect of people management is being redefined. Let's turn to the future. Big picture is now made up on small units. The micro is driving the macro. We are moving towards mass customization with focus on employee of one. We have with us leaders and thinkers who, with us who are managing the change and planning for the future role of HR in the context of micro HR. I now take pleasure to hand over to Mr. T. Murli Dharan, our group chairman, to lead the discussions with our eminent guests. Over to you, T. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, there are a lot of friends here today in this room, um, whom I consider as very personal friends. Uh, first of all, a very special welcome to Santhrip Ji, Rajesh, and uh, KK. All three of them are stalwarts in their own domain. And we are very keen to listen to you today. Like many of them, I'm also very keen to listen. We don't want to appear presumptuous as if we know what the future of HR should be. What we're going to share today is some of our thoughts and we are open for discussions with you and listen to your thought process. Before I start off the proceeding for today, I want to set up some broad um, announcements. The first one is of course the Sequence, I think the sequence is going to be, uh, Ravi will be presenting uh, briefly for 10 minutes about TMI 2.0 after I finish my context setting. And that will be followed by Santripji, Rajesh and uh, Krishna Kumar. Each speaker, I will introduce them uh, at first in the beginning. And especially I want to talk a little bit about the relationship with TMI. And each of them will speak for about 15 minutes and then we will have some questions in the end. Dr. Santrup is going to leave at six o'clock. So I'm going to try and see whether some questions for Dr. Santrup Ji, we can take it up after his talk is over so that he will have the freedom to leave. I've requested uh, Rajesh and uh, KK to stay back because the questions are very critical for many of the audience today. Uh, the post your questions on the, uh, I request all the audience to post their questions in the chat box, mention your name, uh, name of the person to whom you want to ask the question, and we will take it up in the end. We have two components of today's show. The first component is about launching TMI 2.0, which I've chief guest, Dr. Santip Mishra, has agreed to do so. We'll have a very, very, very short five second ceremony on this. Then there will be a talk by uh, our eminent speakers, um, including Ravi, will talk position TMI 2.0. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about TMI 1.0. Whenever we talk about 2.0, we need to talk about what is TMI 1.0. The story started sometime in 1991. And me and my partner, Mr. Thurab Lakadawala, who is from ex Rajasthan Lever, we are batchmates in IMA, and we started an agriculture business in Hyderabad between 1988 to 91, and we failed. And we decided to quit the business and go back to the corporate world. And we're having a cup of tea. And then we, uh, Lakadawala reminded me of my commitment to his father that I will not quit uh, for 1,000 days. There was a shortfall of about 30 to 40 days. And I said, we'll stay back. We'll not quit and keep our commitment. In that 40 days, a friend of my wife, who's currently an IS officer, came one day and he told me, why don't you raise an invoice for 50,000 rupees? I said, what is this 50,000 rupees? What is it for? He said, it's, a, it's called executive search. All you need to do is to make phone calls, connect people, and you make money. I was surprised because I didn't know what executive search was. And that was the first invoicing we did when TMI 1.0 started. Our first business was search in 1991. You've traveled a long distance from there, right? Uh, 
basically today, 30 years later, I'm going to just show you quickly where are we today in TMI uh, 1.0. Achana, can you just put the slide, please? Yes. Yeah, and put it on display mode. So just quickly, uh, very quick background. We are three group companies. We operate in 16 countries now. Uh, our operations um, consist of 470 plus cities in India. And one of our proud customers, we are proud to participate in Birla Sun Life. 470 locations we hire for them, we train for them in, uh, for in, uh, many other companies and 400 plus locations. We have 780 partners, recruitment and training partners. And we work with uh, more than government and CSR customers, more than 51 of them. And we have about 6,500 plus e-learning hours we have clocked uh, on the, uh, both in 13 Indian and in seven international languages. The most interesting part of all of this, which I'm very proud of, is our work in the last one, what you see on the bottom, 1.3 million e-learners. Uh, Ravi has been working with the government of India to educate and train Anganwadi workers. About 1.3 million Anganwadi workers are now trained by TMI group company. And I'm very proud to say that more than 80% of them got certified and they're doing human service and increasing, uh, improving the quality of health services at the village level. So this is where we are. So if you have to summarize uh, where we are today, we are in the top five in terms of third party FLEM or frontline executives and managers recruiting and induction. We are in the top five in India. Nationally, we are also top five in learning content and learning technology uh, with global footprints. I saw you, showed you some of the uh, countries where we are operating. We're also top five in India in the demand driven scaling system. And I'm actually very proud of that because in NLDC ecosystem, we are one of the few partners who right from the beginning believed the government funding is not an option. We went for employer paid demand driven scaling system. We have trained more than about 300,000 people and got them jobs across the country. So this is a very brief story of TMI 1.0. Now I'm going to talk about evolution. I think I am a firm believer that we need to evolve. Everybody has to evolve, the species has to evolve. I personally moved from being an engineer, then I went to an MBA, and now I've just completed my law degree, but I hope to practice in the Supreme Court for five to seven years from now. Similarly, TMI Group has evolved significantly from a single product company to multi-services group. TMI Group is completely transforming itself now to 2.0. Ravi, our group CEO, will talk about and share some of the details shortly. So TMI from a multi-services company is now transforming into a performance, people performance consulting, measurement, modeling, predictive analytics uh, group. Second, we are becoming a tech company, which HR automation, recruiting tech and learning tech under one roof. We have become a very, very uh, experienced now in analytics and tech-based micro-solutioning group. Uh, the solutions will be focused on how do you make employee of one. Why are we doing this? Why is TMI evolving? I think my fundamental belief, and that's the purpose of this seminar, I believe HR as a function also must evolve in the context of major events happening on work automation, uh, remote working, and most importantly, multiple employment relationship. We are no longer going to talk about full-time employees. We're going to talk about gig workers. We're going to talk about part-timers, people talking for sexy timers. Um, going 10 years, 15 years from now, a large number of our employees will be a combination of these. So the focus of HR will have to shift from aligning HR to business to aligning people to performance, to from performance analytics to predictive performance. I think this is a very important transition HR has to make from experience-based hypothesis to data-based hypothesis. You will see later on, Ravi will present some of the ideas. We were surprised that some of the data, which we analyzed data on people behavior, there were a lot of surprises in the way we, the uh, data was telling us a different story than what I thought from my experience. And fourth, from analyzing what we see to discovering what we don't see. Now, these are the, some of the transitions which I think HR has to make. We want to align to this new 
world of HR, and that's why TMI 2.0 is also evolving. So I seek your blessings and good wishes on this new journey of TMI. Now I'm going to introduce very briefly Dr. Santhik Mishra. Everybody knows him. I'll be surprised if many of us in this audience who have not heard of him or seen him in Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. He's a double postgraduate in is a double postgraduate, one in political science from Utkal University and personal management from TISS. He's also a double PhD uh, in public administration and industrial relationship, both in India and UK. He's also a lecturer and reader from TISS Mumbai. He made an extraordinary transition from academics to HR to business leader. 25 years plus in Aditya Birla Group after a short stint in HLL. Uh, elected as the top 25 role models in HR industry in 2019. You are the MD of your own performance and development. That's his famous quote. And I believe he's a perfect example of walking the talk. He has always scripted uh, his position and development in the organization. Patrupji, we are extremely, I'm extremely proud. On my first meeting, I, I don't know whether you remember, in 2000, when you were the HRD network um, president, and I was invited as a member. Your clarity of thought, your articulation, your ability to take people along, and your ability to remember people and their names has been remarkable. I became a fan of you instantly that day when I met you for the first time. Our relationship with the Rati Birla Group and Birla Sun Life has evolved from 2008 when we started. And today we are very, very strong um, relationship with Birla Sun Life. Inaugurate or launch 2.0. Yes, sir. I'm on. You can go and click on that, click to launch. Yeah. This is us, sir. All right. Thank you so much, Santruji. I, I think I'll remember this day for a very long time. I request Ravi now, our uh, group CEO, to quickly present in not more than 10 minutes. Uh, what is this TMI 2.2 all about? Over to you, Ravi. Hey, thank you, Murli. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, sir, we can. Yeah, Ravi, very briefly for the audience, Ravi is a um, BTEC from Benares and MBA from I'm Calcutta. But his very claim to fame is a science fiction fan and is also, in my opinion, one of the best learning science and learning technology expert in the country. He has been with TMI group for more than, I think, 20 plus, 25 years, Ravi? Yeah, 25 plus. 25 plus years. So you have 10 minutes, Ravi. And okay. I warn you two minutes in advance. So try and stick to the time. Thank sure. So thank you. So we've reinvented ourselves many times over the last 30 years. Uh, Murli was talking about the TMI 1.0. Well, it's been 1.0, it's been 1.1, 1.2, and so on. And we have invented ourselves many times over the last 30 years to stay relevant because of you, the customers who have been pushing us, which includes uh, the Birla Group, which includes Access. I think and Rajesh invited us in 2012. And then we've been proud partners of theirs. We are partners with Coca-Cola also, KK. And uh, so we have reinvented ourselves many times over. Uh, having said that, I think this is uh, the biggest reinvention that we are doing, where increasingly we are saying performance is the only language that clients speak. And interestingly, even individuals are speaking. And that's where, uh, based on some of our discoveries, we are thinking that TMI 2.0 has to be anchored around employee of one, whether we are in recruiting, training, learning, the entire life cycle of an employee with an organization into out. We have to start visualizing them as an employee of one. So what some of our discoveries is what I would like to talk about. Uh, I will skip that piece. So we got a lot of counterintuitive discoveries, which we believe, and in our opinion, at least that this is going to push for significant changes in how uh, human capital is managed. It could be in talent acquisition or development or management or even attrition management or any of these places. So I want to share four or five key ones that we have looked at. Like I said, 
number one that we are realizing now from our customers across the spectrum, whether it is IT companies, whether it is BFSI sector, whether it is FMCG, whether it's even overseas. Increasingly, we started working with Japanese companies to send people there. Everywhere, it's a performance matters and nothing else. So everybody, interestingly, is willing to consider different rewards and recognitions, different benefits model, uh, different job roles, uh, like Murli said, gig workers or job sharing, all sorts of combinations are coming out there thanks to COVID uh, impact and thanks to work from home and many more talent becoming available. On the other side, we did some surveys on the employee side. Uh, remuneration still matters the most, including whether they can make uh, the incentives and the performance praise and brand and job security. Of course, thanks to COVID, that's come up a little bit, job security, but otherwise brand and job security comes later. The interesting counterintuitive piece that we are seeing is the variations in performance will be huge. Uh, I'm on, this, on the second point, which I hope you can see. And the variations are really humongous, anywhere from nine times to 16 times uh, is the variation between a poor performer and a good performer. So how can any organization actually sustain this? This is actual data of feet of street in a BFSI sector customer of ours. Uh, uh, while normally one does four quadrants, we looked at uh, our own way of looking at it in six quadrants, though that's not the right word. The middle band is a 50 to 100% and the lower band is this. So if you, if you really see only 16% of them stayed on to actually deliver value to the account. That means they were 100% and beyond. And let's say we given them the honeymoon period of the first three months, beyond that, they are at 100%. And an incredible 45% dropped out of the way very early on. So there is going to be huge variations in performance of the incoming talent. And this needs to be managed. Interestingly, when we moved and looked at it even deeper, even post-training, the right-hand side is post-training what has been the performance of the same 585 people over a period of six months. And you'll see that many of them are in that band or the average performance is between 80% to 120%. That's the average performance. But underlining that is all these 580 guys have different charts below them. We looked at super performers, these 52. Even these 52 have incredible variation in their patterns and all these guys are above 140% of target month after month after month. And that's the sort of variation that managers will have to manage, HR and learning uh, teams will have to manage to see, can I reduce this variation? Why does the, if you look at this bus performer, he's gone up to almost 800, eight times the target for that month, nine times almost, right? And then he drops down to something like five times, then he drops down further, then he climbs up again. Even somebody out here, there is so much of variation. So this jaggedness in performance is something if we can manage, then performance outcome of the organizations is gonna be significantly higher. And this incre increasingly points towards looking at people as an individual. When we looked at attrition, this is for a different set of audience. When we looked at attrition, right, I'm on, uh, point number four, if you can see my screen, we're seeing that role induction training, when you do that really well, and people get role clarity, it speeds up attrition, which is in, in our mind, good attrition. Otherwise, this guy stays on and then doesn't deliver value to the organization and eats up three months or four months or six months of salary. So if you can do good role induction, and then the next stage is the performance pressure. So if you look at it, out of that entire attrition in a period of six, six months that we tracked, almost 96% is early attrition and 70% is there. So is there a good attrition? Can we define good attrition means if productivity does not go up within three months or within six months, depending on the complexity of the product? Should we let go of people? Uh, will HR be also responsible for you know, tactically letting go of people? And I think this was the most incredible discovery that we had when we worked with a bank. So the discussion was who's a good performer? 
who's a good who's a good supervisor and we looked at 10 different uh, aspects of that uh, you know what could be in the equation for defining a supervisor's sales performance and it was interesting that 44% of the standard deviation came down to the dispersion in the performance of the sales of his subordinates right so if he instead of he or she instead of having two or three people operating at three times the productivity norm and half a dozen people operating at 30 or 40% productivity, instead, if they can be between 60 or 70% to 120%, then you can predict the supervisor's sales very significantly. And also the scored attrition of the people who leave this person and go. So interesting modeling can be done out there in terms of who's a good performer and data allows us to do this. So the future we see for TMI, and we are hoping that increasingly organizations are discovering this too, that we will have to look at that micro HR. We'll have to, and I'll tell what we mean by micro HR, because if you really want macro performance, you're going to need micro HR. And we'll have to think of every employee as an employee of one, especially the large volume people who are in frontline sales uh, and the frontline sales managers, whom we have done an extensive amount of work recently. So what do we say? What do we mean by this? We think hiring will become micro. Increasingly, we are saying the same CV, when I show it in different geographies, with the same background, with the same work experience, even sometimes same demographic parameters, they're not getting accepted. Interestingly, even from one branch in Hyderabad to another branch in Hyderabad, the same CV does not get expect, accepted. We're seeing this because the customer types are different. So the branch head who wants to hire them is looking for a different profile. So my standard straw profile is going to keep on getting hyper local and will keep on getting evolved over time, perhaps over season. And sometime you might need a farmer. Sometimes you might need a hunter. So we Ravi, believe hiring will become micro. Maybe two minutes. Go yeah, to... I'm, I'm down to four, four slides only. Two minutes. Yeah. We think training will also be micro because based on the experience, demographic, psychographic, what is the past performance? What are the present competence? We'll have to give something that is interesting for this person. Similarly with learning and coaching and counseling, how can we have one coaching model that fits every employee of ours or every even frontline sales guy of ours? Why would they learn what they already know or something that they're good at? So we need to create, uh, you know, that again, treat them as employee of one and devise models for that. Even the progression path or how do we motivate them? How do we sustain them? How do we ensure that they don't quit and go? All of this, we'll have to think of them as individuals. How are we able to do it? We have recently invested over the last two years, a significant amount of effort in HR analytics, uh, both sides, tableau driven visualization and a lot of statistical analysis, uh, which gives us this descriptive, predictive, and interestingly prescriptive. Can we predict what's going to be the performance and more importantly, say who's the person who should hire, who's the person who can be retained. Data will tell us that if you can partner with customers and model this. So we want to actively partner with our clients to do this. Similarly, on the other side, we have invested over the last 14, 15 months in building HR bots, first for ourselves and now for our clients. We have a US customer now. So bots, because we believe increasingly HR can't be managed by just the recruiter or the payroll person or HR operations staff. You will need bots. The amount of transactions, the amount of data we will need to process is not going to be easy. So we've done some significant investment in HR bots building. And we think a combination of analytics and HR bots, along with this people consulting, where we hope to partner with external consultants, a lot of HR experts are out there. They are our friends. So we want to combine with them, use our analytics, use the bots and build models uh, using that performance analytics and re, uh, you know, remodel our entire delivery of hiring, learning, training, assessments, staffing, the entire uh, schema we are changing. Additionally, I'll just take a minute, Murli. We are working on a very interesting product on peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, we believe this Gen Z is not listening to old people. That's what we are hearing increasingly from many of our customers. They want to listen to each other. So we are creating a product initially for 
frontline executives and managers. It's, it's role centric. It's going to be peer assisted. So we are generating video. The model is to generate video content from performers. So if, for example, Rajesh in Access Bank, someone earns one lakh incentive, if you can ask him what are those three things that he is doing and take that combined with somebody else from some other location who's talking about maybe pitching somebody else about need, need identification. So we have rich video from peers, which will be believable, which will be easy for them to use. And we're building a simple model called ACT, Assess, Correct and Try. So we'll send them through assessments and then they learn good practices from each other, not from gurus whom they think gurus are too good. They can do it. We can't do it. But from peers, they will be willing to learn and improve themselves and they will try and test it. So that is, that is the avatar we see for ourselves consulting, for people performance consulting using analytics, bots. Uh, we will deliver it and then increasingly peer-to-peer -peer learning, peer-to-peer -peer activities. Thank you. KK. Uh, Krishna Kumar. He retired as the chairman of Coca Cola Inc. in 19, uh, just now in 2021, and he's got a very ambitious career ahead. Uh, 17 years in Coca Cola Group, and prior to that, 13 years in uh, Murugappa Group, especially in Yadi Parry. Three years in Tiffany in uh, Dubai. He worked across 50 countries. And I think Rajesh Ji also mentioned we are very eagerly looking forward to your experience, a global experience, and how we can learn something from that. I am I am Bangalore, 1983, Hindi Engineering so, College graduate. But KK, let me warn you, is an extremely outspoken and articulate, very strategic and out of the box thinker. So I, I spoke to him today morning on some of the topics he's going to talk about. He's an amazing thinker of the future. And that's why I'm very glad that he could find time. Our experience with KK started with my brother, Sridhar, who uh, knew him from EID Parry days uh, more than um, 20 years ago. And um, KK has always been there for TMI. Whenever I asked for time, KK always found, found time for me, despite his international travel. So KK, thank you so much for being there for TMI. And I request you to kindly uh, speak and I will, we'll do the Q&A session in the end. Over to you, KK. Oh, thanks, Murli. And uh, I think it was a pleasure uh, uh, listening to both uh, Dr. Uh, Sandrup Mishra and Mr. Rajesh Dahiya. Uh, I'm not a classical, uh, either a HR person or the typical sort of corporate types. So bear with me if I just stray away a bit. Uh, but I think uh, people and performance are very close to my heart. Uh, first, let me congratulate uh, Murli for this extraordinary journey that TMI has had and also uh, for launching uh, the new version, which is, I think, very, very important. I think every organization has to rediscover itself as the context and the environment changes. And I want to recall my association with his brother, Sridhar, uh, who in many ways uh, actually taught me a lot of things in life. Uh, I think we used to have so much of chat with each other because we were uh, personalities who were chalk and cheese, and I would believe that a lot of my performance over the last 25 years, Sridhar has had an indelible stamp on it. And I, I'm sure if he was uh, around, he would. I would. I would say say this to him because uh, some people you don't uh, thank in time, and he was one such person. And I want to recall uh, that he was one of the finest uh, HR. Even though he was not a HR guy, he was a business guy. He was one of the finest HR guys. Well, I, I want to really split what I'm going to say in three parts. The first part, I will dwell a bit on performance. Then I'll go on to future readiness of an HR professional. And finally, uh, the topic which has been which has been suggested to me, which is how can HR be a performance, a people performance consultant? Actually, I don't like the word consultant at all because I, in all my 40 years, I've worked with all consultants. And I, I strongly believe that's, that's one of the money you don't really spend well. Uh, I think I would I would say that uh, I would prefer them being uh, coaches, mentors, players, whatever, except being a consultant. Because consultant by its word says there's no accountability. And for me, having been a business professional, accountability is everything uh, in life. And uh, because every every single resource is important. So I think one of the biggest, I, I, I really like the topic of managing micro performance, using technology, using predictive analytics, I think this is something which I think is something which always is very, very, very useful and very important 
but because of the way the business was especially in india and the emerging markets while in the developed markets all this had started coming in because your businesses were not growing it was stagnating consumers were moving out of mass uh, purchases and going into more customized products so all these became a requirement a slightly ahead of time whereas the emerging markets because of the fact that the gdp was still growing at 7 8% and people knew that the markets are going to keep growing at least for the next 10 20 years people were a bit lax and a bit lazy i would say in terms of embracing all this quickly and so what has happened now is covid has really brought in to some extent uh, the urgency to do this uh, because uh, physicality was used quite a lot in in many of the businesses that i have been involved in so i i want to first stay in the area of uh, performance see the biggest problem is how do you really ensure that performance is understood by everybody across the organization that is the starting point if you want to do micro performance management the first thing is we need to really define performance right from the top to the lowest level of working uh, part of the organization and that is something which most organizations don't take time to do what is the line of sight for instance in my sort of a business the fmcg business a sales person has to how he or she impacts the overall company performance i think that's very important to really define the leading metrics for that take what the company wants to do and pass the uh, leading metrics right down uh, the uh, the uh, the ladder the point was for when i when i used to uh, start my work in many of these organizations the guy in the field when i used to work with them i have worked uh, literally with every one of the sales force in coca cola possibly uh, there are about 10000 people i can confidently say in 17 years i would have at least touched and had a personal contact with most of them thankfully there was no covid so i could do that uh, but one of the things most of the people were surprised were were very worried about when they went to the market is what is expected out of me because not everybody's job at the lowest level is the same we think it is standardized like in fmcg everybody says i go to 20 every salesman visits 20 outlets and what is the big deal i mean everywhere in india it's the same everywhere in the world it's the same but the fact is those 20 outlets as a context is different for each sales person it depends on the consumers in that place it depends on the sort of uh, consumer behavior there it depends on demography affordability so many other parameters so unless the person has one or two metrics which they understand which will ensure that the company can uh, can really maximize its value both to shareholders and to stakeholders i think it's very difficult for them to really start performing that's why you will find that the variation today and i i know murli shared a lot of statistics with me uh, can vary between 16 to 20 times between the worst performer and the best performer and this is no surprise because at the end of the day some people grasp what they are supposed to do and they perform better some people don't grasp and after some period of time they just start waning because once they don't grasp what is performance they think it's something to do with the other person is better he gets more resources and they explain it all so i think it the important thing is that the the cream of the company or businesses in any market is in the depth of managing performance and i i'm so happy to see in this version 2 that uh, tmi is bringing in a whole lot of technological tools which will help in terms of managing the depth of performance I, i'm not using the word micro management because the micro performance because i know murli but uh, all my 25 years of uh, 30 years in senior management the one thing uh, i suppose i always was told that you should not micro manage anything because that's that's not what is expected out of leaders uh, even though now i think everybody realizes the money is in going to the ultimate depth uh, and uh, and managing this so my 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 view on this is i think we should really ensure that we use technology to collect data but collecting data is the only only starting point most organizations just use the collect data and they do very little about it i think you have to collect data and use data to really create analytics and then use time series of data to create predictive analytics not only predictive analytics of future but also predictive analysis even to the extent of saying what can happen this month what happened in the month of october few years back what's going to happen this october and i think that that sort of modeling is what is going to enable 
leveling of micro performance and ultimately that leveling of micro performance is where the money is it is where the opportunity is and it is where the future is going to be for many corporations so for this to happen i think it's important that we we really have a hr function which understands how to really get in and do this i think i personally would 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 really believe this is very important now all this is is really also quite badly exaggerated now because of the present situation almost the workplace has been quite bleep, quite badly disrupted even in businesses like fmcg where nothing happened for the last 70 80 years except that i i remember when we first uh, uh, automated uh, work everybody automated what i did when i started life uh, in 1983 84 i mean people just automated the same thing without realizing the changes that could happen india had a classical distribution system vis-a-vis Uh, many developed markets which had either the evolution of the modern trade or cash and carry and multiple channels of distribution so we we did that but now work has got terribly dis- disrupted or accelerated in terms of disruption thanks to uh, whatever has happened in terms of this uh, pandemic and this has ens- uh, sent many people scurrying for cover now physical meeting a retailer is going to is getting more and more difficult and the opportunity has been seized by many companies who have created b2b platforms so work has been seriously disrupted the second uh, big thing is that work automation has become a must now with our ability to really do anything physical now work automation has become a must and the third thing i think dr santrup uh, mishra alluded to it uh, we now have uh, load in terms of work coming in 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 bits and pieces sometimes it really goes up and needs 3x sometimes it comes to 1x second with the spread of the business you you will be finding it difficult to manage your own workforce so you get into gig workforce or third party managed workforces so at the end of the day you are going to have almost 50 60% of your organization who are not as engaged with the organization as in the past in the past everybody was employed by the organization so everybody had the same level of engagement like we would we used to have scores of 95% and 98% at one point of time in india in coca cola and this was driven by the fact that everybody was employed by the company so everybody had a line of sight but then now as the business progresses 30 40% uh, when you go for outsourced uh, either gig or third party you cannot get that sort of engagement in the light of these changes i i personally believe that this approach which has been uh, put in by tmi is going to be very very helpful for all organizations especially to handle the front end and the front end needs a lot of input in terms of analytics and predictive modeling which will make their work easier otherwise their work becomes pretty difficult and so this is something i find very exciting because i always used to do this uh, uh, this question to all the people in the organization as to can't we predict what's going to happen can't we really help people uh, with the scenario that this is what is going to happen so if you do these three things you will be successful the next month rather than saying that you did three things wrong this month because each month is not going to be the same and each uh, quarter is not going to be the same so i i'm really impressed with what's being uh, worked out now i want to get into the second and the third topic quickly the first the second one is and i i, I have for long seen hr as a person as as a as a function which which has not played the role of being an expert in the business i personally believe in any business unless every function is an expert in the business and what is required for the business it, even if it goes to a, a non financial organization or 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 any other uh, ngo or foundation it's important for people to understand what that institution is expected to do what are its deliverables to the stakeholders what are its deliverables to the shareholders what are the deliverables to the investors so hr has to really be as much expert in the business as the cfo or the ceo is and that i believe is the starting point if you want to be future ready the second thing is hr along with the other people in the organization should force the organization to look from two lenses one lens is present forward the other is future back because present forward and future back completely need different lenses and hence need completely different performance metrics 
and hence need completely different performance management systems. So they have to, and for HR to be successful, they have to be fully on top of what is the present forward strategy of this company and what is the future back strategy of this company because both these will be parallel and will keep converging from time to time and then again diverging because that's the only way you an organization can survive the test of time. So I, I'm sure with uh, version two, uh, I think version one will also continue for some time till it fully migrates to version two for TMI. And this I believe is important for every organization. And once get, HR gets this absolute perspective, then it becomes easy for them, right? From recruiting, skilling people, ensuring they have the right performance parameters, top down. I think HR should play a big role what I call is in deploying strategy into understandable metrics. So people know if this metric is moving like this, I'm in helping the company to achieve whatever it is strategic thought process or goal. I think that is the second phase, second part the HR should do. First, they should be part of the first telescopic thinking. I mean, sorry, uh, the first far-sighted thinking. Second, they should be uh, able to really uh, translate it into a deployment strategy. And then it's they have to ensure that the right people are recruited. And then they are skilled, not only skill the uh, front end, but also skill the leaders. Because most of the time, skilling people who are being led by somebody who is not capable is not uh, is not a great idea. So I think that is that is the way I feel uh, they can be part of the future, and they can not only be part of the future, they can define the future, co-define the future of the company. I think it is time HR demands a seat on the table and demands co-creating the future. Because if they can't do that, then they can't manage uh, the next step, which is being uh, really the custodians of uh, performance or the catalyst of performance, whatever you want to call it. I think that's 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 my personal view. Fortunately for me, I have had people who, who, who did this. So I, I for me, HR was uh, a cakewalk because most of my HR folks were possibly uh, fantastic uh, guys who stood by me. So I want to, at this point of time, call out that uh, they, they have been excellent uh, sort of uh, in, in doing what I said. Coming to the fact, I think I think it's very important. I, I actually hated the performance appraisal, appraisal system. Uh, I have personally gone through sort of 40 appraisals. I have had seven coaches, global coaches, whatever, whatever. So but I, I felt this performance appraisal system had no, added no value. Uh, while when I used to work with people, all my DRs, I would give them a monthly sitting down and say what's going right, what's not going right, and what we should be doing. And I personally don't like any to sit on judgment on anybody. Now, I go back to what uh, both Rajesh uh, Daya and Dr. Santhrup Mishra said. We have to ensure that we are running with the person in terms of ensuring performance. And if we don't see that person really reacting to or, or relating to what we are doing, then we should really possibly uh, split ways rather than really wasting that person's time for three, four years and then saying you've not really done your job. So I believe the new approach based on whatever technology and inputs we get should be something like a very seamless, continuous, it is called, I think, performance enablement. I think that's the right jargon, a system where you really work with people at the micro level and ensure that they know literally every week that they are in the right direction or not in the right, right direction. And we do everything that will help from an organizational perspective, but also everything that will help from the individual perspective where they have to make changes or they have to get skilled. Because that's the right approach. Because I think micro approach is not only micro in terms of the level of the organization, but I believe it should be micro even in terms of the time. I think everybody's time is precious. It's not just the organization's time. So it's important for us to literally give a weekly feedback or a 15-day feedback or, or a monthly feedback. I know when I was in the front end in those levels, I would speak to my team of 150 people once a week, individually, literally. Even though the STD was not easy, it was like uh, phone calls was much more difficult than this. But that is the only way by which you can ensure that this data can be put to good use. This analytics can be put to, there's no point in having a predictive model. And then you tell them at the end of the month, hey, this is what was the predictive model and this is what you've done. I've seen many organizations where they just keep it as a toy. It should not be a toy. It should be something you do, you do, you do on a regular basis. For me, I think the ultimate role HR can play, I would really sort of summarize it. And then I will give you one or two examples if I have the time early. Otherwise, I'll summarize it and close it. I think I, I, I think the first thing the HR 
as I, I have already explained the macro stuff the HR person should do. But the micro stuff is really understand what is expected in terms of the metrics to be delivered and ensure that the right person is put into the job under the right leader. And why I am saying this, it's very important because, and you have to jointly skill the leader and the person to be able to, to deliver that performance. And then you keep monitoring it on a continuous basis and course correct. You don't have to go to people who are on the right course every, every week or every month. You can leave them alone. You go to the people who need the correction, which means you are talking about 10, 15% of the total uh, play of, uh, people whom you have to connect. Because if you connect, then it'll really, uh, you, will, uh, you will really win. So I, I think this is what I, I would say. And I would just give one example so that you, you relate to whatever I have said. Uh, for instance, uh, in one of my uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, um, assignments, I, I, I'll give you one example which happened in India. It was the state of Gujarat. Actually, we were doing very badly, and uh, we 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 were surprised because I, it just uh, goes into what uh, Murli was saying. We had one part of the state where we had a market share of somewhere around seventy percent. And then we had uh, two parts of the state where our market share was 4%. And, uh, it, and uh, when we looked at the team, all the team members had spent seven to 10 years in the business. They knew the business. They have, some of them had worked in the 70% area and moved to the area where it was 6%. But we found for almost 10 to 12 years, it was really, it had deteriorated and this was the situation. So I think we were continually changing people, thinking that people were the problem. Uh, but I, I'm not a guy who likes to fire people. So we were just changing people from one region to the other, but getting them into Gujarat, but the failure was happening. Then when we went in, I, I think this is this is what I, we, we did exactly uh, what uh, is being done with technology now manually. I, I always believe if you torture data, it gives you the truth. And then it gives you models and everything. But if you don't torture the data and use the data to explain your point of view, it doesn't tell you anything. So when we when we really tortured the data, we found in the other two parts of the state, uh, we had a completely different competition set. We had a completely different demography of people. And we were just doing the same thing we were doing in the 70% two territories, and it was not working. So we were able to enable the performance of people there by trying by reworking the way we should approach these places and believe it or not at an overall level that territory used to be at about 14 15 percent as you would imagine went up to 70 percent everybody came up and we had this concept which tmi is talking about where everybody performed equally one part is the fact that we have to ensure that we enable performance which is killing ensuring we give the right business tools for the person to be successful. The other is to getting the right skills into the person and also ensuring we give sufficient motivation by giving them line of sight to what they're doing for the company. I think when these two come together, I believe you get more even performance than, than this sort of distributed performance. So I want to finally close with this fact. See, I, I, I'm a strong believer. I know that this topic about it's performers who create business. I agree with that. But the fact is, it's people who are performers. See, even today, you can't open a computer and win a market share in FMCG company in any part of the world. You have to really go in and get people trained to read your models, to understand your models, go and execute it, and then you have to win it. So I, I personally believe that uh, uh, I'm a strong believer that every person is, is pretty good. Because your selection process, you have gone through what is required. If you've done it well, then every person who comes into you is very good. And it is the company with its performance management process. I, I don't like this word appraisal. Performance management or performance enablement process, which makes them successful or not successful. Now, we, having seen what this uh, version 2 is, I feel this can go a long way in enabling this performance enablement process well and ensure that uh, people are successful, even if they stay for a short while. Thank you, uh, Murli, for the opportunity. And this is what I had from you. Thanks. How should the frontline executive be ex ex equipped to manage the changing customer uh, in the marketplace? Take a vote. Uh, this is an excellent question, but I think this is a work in progress, uh, really, for most companies. Uh, because the world is, uh, this is uh, good in the sense, good question, because 
the world is moving from a situation where everybody wanted a standardized product which is good and is to some everybody wants uh, very very specialized products now what is we it's done in two ways one is you every company tries to create a more differentiation creates a range of products which satisfy every consumer needs but also technology is used and i can talk about a technology which coca cola uses in the us where with with uh, it's it's a machine which is uh, ai enabled etc uh, which can deliver about 400 beverages you can go and store the type of beverage you want which can be a mix of coke and sprite and fanta and some juice and whatever it is and the next time you it senses your mobile it will serve the drink to you so technology is being used to ensure that they develop this capability and i think i have read this experience of asian paints also where they have created a, a machine which can give you any shade you want you can increase or decrease it so technology is going to be used and what is going to happen is some type of distributed manufacturing will evolve where the sales person will be equipped to go and sell a solution and not a product they will sell you they will possibly sell a machine which can give say 500 options because a retailer cannot stock final options which will be made with four or five cartridges like this is happening in every industry people are using technology to deliver that so i would call this as a solution and not a product range so this is something which is evolving across the world and in india i think the person who is really pioneered it is, is asian paints and paints